Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. 1 Peter chapter 5, and here's what the, uh, the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Peter. That's more accurate than what Peter said. Here we go. The elders who are among you, I exhort... I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Now, before I go on to verse 2, which is a very famous portion of Scripture, notice this, the elders who are among you, I exhort. The elders who are among you. Remember, he's writing to the people of the dispersion. And he listed off Pontus and Cappadocia and all these places that we know is Asia Minor. It was, it's a portion of modern day Turkey. And he's saying, I want to speak a word now to the elders who are among you, those who are of the mature, those who are recognized as leaders among you. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I want to encourage you, elders, stick with it. And then he goes on to say, I, who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. What's interesting is, you know, we always think about and talk about what the Bible says about being witnesses of the resurrection. But notice Peter has emphasized several times here in this book the sufferings of Christ, that it's an important part of the gospel that Jesus suffered for us. He suffered to get the message to us. He suffered to get salvation to us. And the reason that's important in this particular letter, among others, is that Peter's writing to people who are suffering because they're Christians. They're suffering persecution. And Peter is saying, you're in good company because since Jesus brought this gospel to this perverse, wicked world in the first place, he suffered. And you're suffering because you're a part of the sufferings of Christ. So he said, I'm a witness. I was with him in his earthly ministry. I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And he says, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So I, whom a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So on the other side of our sufferings, for being Christians, for having a testimony, for staying true and faithful to the Word of God, on the other side of those sufferings, there is glory, there is reward, there is the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Paul talked about, and Peter's mentioning that same thing. Now watch this. He's still talking to the elders. We would call them pastors, leaders, but here's what he says, verse 2. To the elders, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd them. Shepherd the flock of God. All these people that I'm writing to, all these people who are among you, that who are believers, they're the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Don't serve because people pressure you to do it. and You should do it. Why don't you do it? No, but willingly serve as overseers. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Don't do it to try to take advantage of people. Well, if I hold this position, then I can get better business deals with different people. And no, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, eagerly serve in this position nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This is Peter rehearsing what he learned from Jesus. Jesus said, the Gentiles lorded over people. He said, but it won't be so among you. You're gonna, the greatest among you will be the servant. Do you remember this? Now Peter, uh, some 32, 33 or so years after Jesus died and was raised from the dead, now he's still preaching these same truths. Do you remember Jesus said in the Great Commission, 
go make disciples. And he went on to say, teaching them to obey those things I've commanded you. Here, 30 some years later, Peter still teaching those things that Jesus commanded him. Okay, so be not... Uh, not being lords over them and trusted you, but being examples to the flock. And watch this, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, capital C, capital S, when the chief shepherd appears, who is that? Well, that's Jesus. He is the chief shepherd of the flock of God, the body of Christ. When the chief shepherd appears, you, you elders, you overseers, you who willingly served as examples, not in... Uh, uh, dominion, like dominating people, controlling people, um, uh, dishonestly extracting wealth from people. No. He said, humble, willing, serving shepherds. He said, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That crown will be your crown for all of eternity for doing this right now. Boy, I tell you, that's a, that's a long-term reward for a short-term assignment. Our time on earth is so short compared to eternity. Verse 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. So he was talking to the elders. Now he's talking to the younger people. You younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So this is similar to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. I believe it's the maybe 20, 20th verse or so where he says, submitting yourselves to one another, submitting yourselves to one another, maybe the 21st verse. But here Peter says, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Oh, may we all be clothed with humility, not pride. We're here to serve each other and bless each other. So it says, and be clothed with humility for, watch this, and he quotes, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we hit this in the book of James because James also quoted this. But notice God resists the proud. God is not passive toward the proud. He doesn't merely ignore the proud. No. He resists the proud. God actively resists the proud. Let me tell you, folks, if God is resisting you, there's no sense pushing harder. You're not going to push God down. You're not going to push him out of the way. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The only way to deal with being resisted by God for your pride is to humble yourself. That's the only way. You're not going to overcome God. That's for sure. But notice he gives grace to the humble. In other words, if you're humble, he'll help you. He'll add his supernatural power to support you. Okay, so verse six, uh, verse six, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. See, there's the grace. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. That he may exalt you. Notice the three words in due time time. Promotion doesn't always come when we want it to come. We have to trust the Lord. Don't push for it. Don't force it. Don't try to manipulate it. Don't try to hint for it. No, you humble yourself. You're, you're pushing yourself down, serving, humbling yourself, and the mighty strong hand of the Lord will exalt you in due time. And it says, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Did you know casting your care on the Lord is an act of humility? That's what it says. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all your care on him for he cares for you. See, we have a tendency to want to take care of ourselves. We'll fix the problem. We'll do it. But humility is, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let the Lord do it. That doesn't mean we don't fix a lot of problems, but uh, before the Lord, we don't try to exalt ourselves, promote ourselves and such. We humble ourselves and we serve, trusting that the Lord will do it. And he said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care, that kind of care is worry. 
worry. There are two, two different Greek words for care here. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. It's the same English word, but it's two different Greek words. And the first one, casting all your care, that's anxiety and worry. Casting all your worry on him. But the fact that he cares for you, he's not worried about you, no. But he affectionately is looking out for you, loves you and such. Aren't you glad to have a Savior, Jesus, who does this for us? Just, I mean, take time, cast your care over on him. Say, Lord, I cast my worries over on you because I know you care for me. You're not going to let me uh, go down the tubes or leave me hanging, uh, not allow me to be promoted when the right time comes. Lord, I put that in your hands and I trust you. All right. Now, this is very important. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Notice, be sober. That doesn't mean uh, just don't be under the influence of anything. That means be sober-minded, be spiritually minded, be level-headed in spiritual things. Be alert, be sober, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, notice we have an adversary, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy. Well, that's what Jesus told us in John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, this says the devil does that. So we've identified him as a thief right now. And so watch this. It says... Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for somebody to destroy, to devour. And it goes on to say, resist him, who? The devil. Resist him steadfast in the faith. In other words, you don't just resist him and never resist him again. You steadfastly resist him in the faith, in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are... Uh, the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You're not the only one the devil's attacking. You're not the only one he's tempting. You're not the only one he's trying to get to commit adultery or to quit or to be prideful or to succumb to the love of money. No, you're not the only one. This is These temptations are throughout the world of all the brethren. So notice, though, he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith. So let me ask you this. What if you don't resist him? Well, he's going to devour. He's going to destroy something. Well, if he destroys something, is that God's fault or is it our fault? See, a lot of times when people have things going on in their lives where there's been destruction, they'll say, I don't know why the Lord let this happen. The Lord let that happen. Well, right here, the Lord told us. Be awake, be alert, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary is trying to destroy you. Resist him. Don't let him do it. Well, that sounds like Paul in the sixth chapter of Ephesians when Paul said, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then he went on to say, and take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so we're supposed to stand against the devil. James 4, 7 says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Well, what if you don't resist him? What if you're not resisting him steadfast? Well, he's going to destroy things. And for us to turn around and to blame it on God and to say, well, I don't know why the Lord did this to me or the Lord took this away or the Lord devoured this or the Lord allowed this to happen. And the Bible says, it's our responsibility to use the name of Jesus, to use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and to resist the devil, to come against him in prayer. You remember Jesus in the wilderness? Satan was attacking him and tempting him, and he, Jesus just kept saying, it is written, and he kept quoting Scripture, quoting Scripture. He was resisting the devil with Scripture, with the Word of God. Well, if we don't do that and the devil rips us off, we can't blame it on God. We're the ones that didn't resist him. We're the ones that didn't withstand him. See, and so he's taught us how to do it. He modeled it for us, but we have to do it. These promises belong to us, but the devil will steal every one of them if we let him. Okay, verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us 
to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Praise God. Oh, may the Lord, he said, after you have suffered a while. Does that mean God's going to say, I'm just going to let you suffer a while? But no, that's not what Peter's saying, that God just wants to let this happen for a while. But what he's saying is, we all experience suffering. We all experience temptation. We all experience attacks of the devil. But he's saying, may the Lord, he's praying for us, may the Lord who sees this suffering, may he comfort you and may he establish you, strengthen you, settle you. In other words, he come right in there and give you what it takes so that you don't succumb to the enemy. This reminds me of what Jesus said to Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat, which, by the way, is another indicator that Peter was the number one apostle because Satan asked for Peter by name that he might have the ability to sift him like wheat. He wanted to do to Peter what uh, he was allowed to do to Job. And Jesus said to Peter, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. <laughs> In other words, you resist him and you won't let that happen. See, so he'd been given authority. Uh, he was being given the authority in the name of Jesus. And so it was up to Peter now to use that authority to not let that happen. So Jesus said, I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith would not fail. Well, it goes on to say, may God do these things. To him, verse 11, be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. This is likely uh, John Mark, who would have been uh, would have written the Gospel of Mark, who was a relative, you remember, of Barnabas. And so it says, in fact, many people believe that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark, but with the influence of Peter. And you can see here the connection that Peter had with him. So he said, she was in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you. And so does Mark, my son. So John Mark was a spiritual son of Peter's. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all. Peace to all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, what an absolutely precious book this was. I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't catch all of the chapters, go back and catch the other chapters because it's really worth looking at this precious book of 1 Peter. And next, of course, 2 Peter, another phenomenal, little shorter, but just as powerful book.